Property rights scholar Robert Ellickson once described how cattle ranchers in the Shasta Valley of California dealt with the problem of cattle escaping from their fields and trespassing on other people's land. To deal with such problems, ranchers came up with their own informal rules and social norms, what Ellickson called order without law. For example, to keep cattle in their fields, ranchers would often follow the tradition of splitting the costs of building and maintaining a fence. Where one, fan, where one rancher would buy the fencing materials and the other would provide the labor. With such agreements, there's no need to resort to formal contracts or get government involved. Governing can be done by ranchers themselves working as peers. A kind of commons evolves. If one careless rancher refuses to follow the rules, the community can encourage compliance through talking to him, pressuring him, even gossip and shaming. In a commons, reputation matters. It's not about money and markets. This is a simple example of creating order without law, a dynamic that lies at the heart of any commons. Sometimes it's called vernacular law, meaning the unwritten social norms and practices and traditions that enable a group to govern itself. Patterns of peer governance mostly focus on how we manage social and personal relationships. But they also involve methods for dealing with property, money, and markets, because property, money, and markets will destroy a commons unless special measures are taken. A commons needs buffers and intermediaries to protect itself from market enclosure. It's worth pointing out that governance is not the same as government. We all know that government exercises authority and control over people through laws and court rulings and various policies. Government these days is so closely associated with the idea of collective interests overriding individual freedoms that it's hard to imagine governance as something good and necessary or indeed liberating. But that's what peer governance is. One could say that peer governance is about honoring the informal and creative and situation-specific in managing things and then providing supportive structures for those. It's about getting the balance between structure and culture just right, avoiding the rigidities of too much structure and the chaos or tyranny of too little structure so that creative, appropriate innovation can flourish. It's important to realize that commons are living processes that unfold. They're verbs, not nouns. Pure governance is an open-ended process by which people identify their own needs and devise their own ways of dealing with them. People have to bring their knowledge and co-learning to the table. They must be creative in developing customized solutions that seem fair and effective. Silke Helfrich and I identified 10 patterns of pure governance that help create trusted, transparent systems of deliberation and coordination. The first, most important one is bring diversity into shared purpose. Bringing people with different personalities and talents into general agreement takes time, but it builds a powerful, durable engine of provisioning. The core task is to respect the individuality of diverse members while forging an ethic of solidarity. There are other patterns of peer governance, such as honor transparency in the sphere of trust. This is the idea that commoners don't just have to make formal information disclosures, they have to be willing to express and receive criticisms that might be embarrassing but essential, while showing respect and affection for one another. Another important pattern is share knowledge generously. As we see in so many open source communities, sharing knowledge is hugely generative. It allows the group to amass its collective wisdom and solve problems in super creative ways. It even produces its own kind of moral and technical order because the sharing of knowledge sends a powerful signal. I respect openness and freedom. Of course, no commons can function without another pattern, assure consent and decision-making. While it's often assumed that consensus is the ideal way to go in the commons, or that everybody has to agree to everything, this type of harmony is rare. Disagreement is a reality of human existence. And even when consensus can be achieved, that doesn't mean everyone agrees. Commoners need to re reject the idea 
of winners and losers in deliberation and debates, which is frankly the problem in representative democracy and voting. Majority rule can create polarization and instability. In the commons, one must work hard to work through differences honestly and with respect. The goal is to secure consent from everyone, which doesn't necessarily mean total agreement, but rather the absence of reasonable objections. Commons around the world have devised all sorts of systems for peer governance, but one popular form is sociocracy. This is the process for group deliberation and decision-making that lets all voices be heard and then synthesized for the benefit of the whole enterprise. It's important to make a final note about money, markets, and property as they affect commons. Cooperation in a commons can be shut down if people become fixated on money. If, if co-op housing members, for example, decide to cash out when market prices rise, or if medical researchers try to patent drugs that were developed through community collaboration, then the commons is at risk of collapsing. A commons that ends up depending on selling something will soon become a market player and abandon its social solidarity and all the rest as everyone, as individuals, grabs for all the money they can. That's why it's important to keep commons and commerce distinct, another pattern. A commons must preserve its integrity as a community and protect its shared wealth in the face of businesses that are only too eager to appropriate them. Investors and corporations want to commodify and privatize shared land and water, forests, genes, images, smells, even sounds and smells, in order to make money. This often amounts to enclosure, as we saw in an earlier session a dispossession of commoners. Much as artists need agents to act on their behalf when dealing with corporations and markets, so commons need internal systems to protect their values as commoners, to separate their commercial dealings, if they have any, from their lives as commoners. For example, an individual may be able to cut wood from a community forest, but only for personal use or their household use, not for market sale. To assure that a fishery is not overexploited, a fishery commons may set limits on how much fish an individual can sell on the open market. These are some of the most important patterns of peer governance. Because peer governance is a living process, not a thing, it has to be adapted to the particular situation, the specific landscape, the history, the traditions and values the culture, the political circumstances, the personalities of that given commons. And this is precisely what makes a commons so strong and adaptable. It's a hardy social organism precisely because it's a living structure. And a living structure can't emerge from a blueprint or a detailed design. It can only arise from a generative living community and process. It has to evolve on its own terms in its own distinctive way, in its own unique context. That's the essence of commoning.